Hi, I'm Eddie Burke. I've been the bartender at the Hollywood Improv for 40 years, and this is my podcast, Eddie's Bar at the Improv. Guys, this is Eddie Burke. This is my podcast, Eddie's Bar at the Improv. My wonderful guest today is Adam Ray. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to cheer for yourself that, sometimes. That's it's the, the dark w- business. That's the way I like to hear it start. Adam is an actor, comedian, writer, voiceover artist. Hey, uh, did you research? Oh, Adam. Yeah. How long have I known you? What? To, quite a, week, a while. A week, two Since, weeks? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, there, it is funny. There's certain people that you, not only in this business, but being in L.A. and just in life, that you meet and truly from day one you feel like you've known them for 20, mm-hmm. 30 years. And yeah. you are that guy. I'm sure a lot of people have the same sentiment with you. But also, you know, you're kind and, and generous with your, your time and your eye contact. But I can tell just from knowing <laughs> you when you're looking at someone and you're like, God, please make this person stop Disappear. talking. Yeah. <laughs> this conversation is sucking the soul out of me. Do you know how often that happens? Yeah. But, but I, I never feel like I get that from you. I feel like we're, no, well, we're dialed in. No reason. It's, you yeah. know, it's usually the people that do not stop talking. And yeah. the funny thing about people like that is they could be talking and I could walk away <laughs> and they keep talking. Uh, yeah. It yeah. doesn't matter and that I'm not there. They won't there. scream at you. They'll just keep staying at the exactly. same level. Yeah, That's Exactly. It, it's, it's all that. But anyway, let's toast let's to cheers. the fact that you're here. Cheers. Thank let's you. To, I appreciate it. health and mm-hmm. fun. Definitely. And someone with all the stories finally having a platform to tell them. Oh, it, it's, uh, it's been fun so far. Yeah, you're I crushing mean, it. The, the, some of the stories that I have uh, found out, I don't remember. Yeah. That uh, when I've sat here and, let's say, talked to Kevin Nealon, yeah. it's also funny how we were at the same place at the same time, but we have totally different memories <laughs> of what happened. Oh, right. I, I could sit here and go like, well, wait a second. That's not what happened. But I won't say that because maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. And and he or someone else is <laughs> yeah. right. It's yeah. like, because it's very possible, you know, that, that I, it's rare that I make a mistake. Who's, but, who's older, you or Kevin Nealon? Oh, I am. I'm older, older than everybody. Well, your skin looks better. There's so. <laughs> also, well, we should know, if you hear that hammering in the background... Uh, they are tearing down the improv and putting in a cheesecake factory. That's a che- oh, I it's thought fun. it was an In-N-Out Burger. No, no, dude, Cheesecake Factory rules the world. Uh, Have you been to a cheesecake factory in the last ten years? Yeah, yeah. I I, I love Cheesecake Factory. Yeah, it well, and I knew you'd say yeah because if you were to poll <laughs> most just decent people, there's it's tough to not want to find a reason to go to a place. There's certain things that I will do at least like once a year, even every couple months. Like, I'll watch that video of Oprah giving away cars just to remind myself that, like, the world ain't that bad of a place, you know? Or I'll watch the fight that happened, the, the uh, Malice at the Palace, the Pistons Pacers brawl on uh, YouTube. Yeah. Oh, just I love again that one. to go, mm-hmm. stay on your toes. Anything can happen. I'll watch Two Girls, One Cup just to remind myself, keep working hard so that you don't have to fall on such hard times where that becomes the best option and hopefully you don't have to audition for that if that does become the best option you're you're a big sports fan huge speaking of that huge. It, it's did you play ball in in school so i played i was you know definitely that uh classic story of jock who did theater so it was like i played sports from the get-go and uh basketball was always my first love kind of got Swindled into football because I was a bigger kid, you know, uh, I was a, a, a fat kid, which you know, I famously talk about being quick fat. Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, I was the tallest kid. I was fat as fuck, but I was like fast. So again, quick fat. I was thick. I shot the three. I had like decent ball handling skills. I would dominate. And I was like, oh, I'm going pro. I just recently found a tape of it back home in Seattle and cut two different highlight reels and put them on my Instagram, at Adam Ray Comedy, because I've been talking about it for so long, and people were like, dude, where are these quick, fat videos? And so I found one, and it was uh, reassuring to see, and remind, because in my head I was like, dude, I remember being really good at that age, but people were like, dude, fucking where's the proof? And uh, look at these videos, dude, like, I'm dominating. So in my head I'm like, oh, I'm going pro. Like, I'm only gonna get taller, I'm only gonna get (laughs) slimmer and get better. And faster. And then you, you know, you peek out at six feet and a half and you're like, all right, I'll uh, I'll play in a 24 hour fitness pickup game and get tired after 10 minutes. Yeah, that's my life. The, uh... But yeah, I wanted to go pro in, in, in all sports. Football, I didn't care about as much. I quit football sophomore year of high school to play Danny Zuko in Greece. And that's when I kind of knew 
as you do, that uh, that acting was going to kind of be the path and not professional sports. No, that's too bad. Because, yeah. you know, it, it's... Uh, the dream has to die at some point. Yeah, I guess so. But, you know, I, I there's probably not a lot of uh, space between... Uh, an athlete and an actor in mm. the sense of, of following your dream totally. and being an artist. When did you start comedy? Uh, I think it was probably, well, I started stand-up officially in 2007. I did my first open mic in 2001 before, you know, I graduated from high school in June and then came down here to go to acting school at USC in August. And so there was a two-month window where I had to kind of get, you know, things in order and test the waters and stand up so that I came to LA with not a complete uh, overwhelming feeling of like, oh, this is a really intimidating world to jump into. So even doing two open mics, I felt like, all right, I do stand up, you know, and I can, <laughs> and I felt that much more comfortable to pop into an open mic here. But I didn't do it. Uh, I did maybe two frat parties while I was in, uh, in uh, college at SC and studied abroad in London my junior year and, you know, at the uh, British American Drama Academy and did, I was you know, Shakespeare break- and all that high comedy and, and, and uh, stage combat and was unbelievable. Did a couple bars there. Um, my, my go-to joke was about how Arnold Schwarzenegger just become governor and I was like, he can do anything now. He could literally like, he's governor, like you can test the waters, you can push the boundaries. Like he could even, he could even, dude, he could fuck a cow. He could bring bestiality back and make <laughs> it cool. You know, and so then I acted out Arnold Schwarzenegger fucking a cow. And, <laughs> that uh, had to be hard. Just to do like a bad Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then I, but then I would stop halfway through well, and the do, cow do would it start. For us. Go for it. Just so I'd be like, and then go, and then halfway through, I'd stop and go, as the cow, I'd go, hey, 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 <laughs> like, let's, we talk, you know, lighten up, you know, and then, uh, I, I, uh, I was going to bring that up bit. about you going over to London, to London yeah, because yeah. it, I, I wasn't aware of your extensive training, mm. I mean, and, well, a lot of comics just, you know, get into acting and, and quite a few of them, you know, shit, Andrew Santino, for example, like, I don't know how much acting training, I think he did theater in college, but mm. what does that really mean? I, it wasn't like a, you know, I, went, I auditioned for the BFA program at USC where uh, they, you know, thousands audition each year. They take 15 to 20 kids for the program to go through all four years together. It's a very rigorous program. All your classes are laid out from nine to six. You get the better teachers, the better shows. Um, but again, like Santino, like just r- natural raw ability, and I'm sure took some classes. But there's people like that that just can jump in and figure it out, and they've, they're they're locked in. But you know, that's what I wanted to do first and foremost, and still is. And uh, well, I think is, you guys, uh, you have a I don't want to say an advantage, but you have an affinity for relating to people. Yeah, being stand up comics, and that's what acting is all about. Yeah, is relating to whoever you're talking totally. to. Totally, you're. That's actually a really great point. Like the amount of uh, you know, connecting that I felt like I didn't have as much of an issue off the bat as I thought I would and listening and just kind of feeling that give and take with the crowd, I'm sure you can attribute to just all the acting classes and, and, uh, and knowing how much listening matters, especially like, you know, now I do a decent amount of crowd work, especially when I'm headlining uh, on the road and doing an hour and change. It's like that listening part is truly like a make or break. Yeah. And also not only if you're interacting with an audience member, but just for the overall show, like listening to the room as you're, you know, with your rhythms and and the pace of what's happening and, and knowing when to switch things up and, and when to maybe just power through for 20 minutes and, and, and just, you know, like I say, like my album is called like reading the room, you know, like Mm -hmm. just getting a a gauge on. That has to be a kind of a unique talent and to be able to do that, to, to read a room, it'd be like me reading the bar. I know what you, you know, do. You know, oh, yeah, yeah you knowing, do. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it's truly. I think every aspect of of life. I mean, you're doing that daily. Whether like shit, man. If somebody doesn't say thank you when I op- open a door for them, like part of me wants to be like fuck off. Like as they walk in, and I have done it once, and they turn around like what? I'm like say thank you, and then they're like fuck you, man. You know, and it's a whole thing. <laughs> and sometimes it's like maybe, maybe just think it and don't say it. You know, yeah. and move on with your day. But like you at the bar, I mean, there's times when you're like. Should I get this guy another one? He's a good guy. He's clearly fucked up. He's actually now, uh, you know, infringing on the good time of the people near him. So right. maybe I need to shut him down. Yeah. What's the way of doing that without being a complete asshole? Right. I mean, there's there is no way to, to him to yeah. to that person. It's very rare that that you're person, pretty direct. 
Yeah. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. I, you know, and usually I'll, I'll be nice about it at the beginning, even though I'm, my wonderful demeanor is a little bit on the stern side. Sure. I'll, I'll be like, you know, man, I, you've had enough. But what, you, you, what do you mean I've had enough? Was, well, look, you know, you, I, you're bothering them. You're yelling. You're doing this. Yeah. No, no, I'm not. I'm not doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think actually you're doing that. And you know what, dude? This is the problem with Jews. And you're like, all right, see, <laughs> nobody said anything about that. And now you truly have to leave because you're bringing oh, people into the, this that have nothing to do. Oh, moving on here. The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was bar mitzvahed and what? circumcised. On the same day, no. That's pretty no, good. That's a is. unique trick. They usually do it. They uh, usually do it when right you're born. Yeah. Birth, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't get to pick my rabbi either, which I feel pretty gypped about. Are you serious? The guy who, well, no, for my bar mitzvah. Your moil for my uh, whoever for the, cut for the your snip. little thing. Yeah, yeah. You didn't get to pick that. No, I would have loved to because that's a very that's an intimate thing to have somebody's hand. It on, is. Uh, I mean, yeah. like, can you even call it a penis at that stage? Is it really like, you know, it's. It's pretty flash. Anyway, what was your next question? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what made you decide that you were ready to come to L.A. or, or whatever? Oh, to, man. To, yeah, to pursue this? Well, so, yeah. so comedy, uh, to, back to your early question, I, I, you know, I was uh, mimicking a lot of teachers and friends. There was a girl that moved to, you know, recognizing that you have kind of a, uh, you know, a decent, uh, you know, uh, an innate ability to kind of make people laugh. Happened pretty early on with like prank calling Seattle sports radio stations. I would do that late at night. I'd listen to a Sonics or a Mariners game. And then I'd call these sports stations as I laid in bed and would prank like three different times in a row with a different voice. And, and I would sometimes I'd try to, you know, have a, a legit call so that they would, you know, uh, let me on. And then I'd call back and do something like where I'd be like, it's so like the Mariners, I just really think like. The pitching's like the biggest problem right now, but I think if we just like, if they just, you know, start Randy Johnson every game and they're like, yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen anyway, next call or whatever. And then I go back and be like, yeah, I think, uh, sorry, my inhaler's not working. I think, uh, I think if, uh, K. Griffey Jr. is like, he's pretty much past his prime, but I know he's, they're like, dude, he's two years into the, into the league. I'm like, yeah, I think he's dead. I think we should trade him for the Phillies mascot and some peanuts. And they're like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? And they would hang up on me. Well, and so I do that over and over again, and I would tape it on my little uh, my first Sony, and then bring it on the bus at at school and play it for friends. And they were like, "I can't believe you did that!" And they were laughing and stuff. And so that's when I kind of started to be like, "Oh, there's maybe uh, you know something there." And it was just fun. That's yeah. all it was. You're not Is thinking that... about making it a career. And then I would. But you wrote for Punked. Oh yeah, you, which for a minute, uh, yeah. which is kind of like the same thing. Kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean the the prank call thing I mean just hearing so much like jerky boy stuff and uh, as a kid and um, and you know Sandler albums mm -hmm. which had some sketches that were kind of I think prank related and um, and you know doing it there was a girl that uh, moved to our um, uh, school district named Andy Bernhard and uh, she was in fourth grade and I was in fourth grade and everybody had a crush on her she was like the new it girl and you know again like I was at my peak fatness I was you know probably 180 in the fourth grade just double fisting <laughs> pop tarts just barring my mom's sports bra and uh and uh you know dads were hitting on me like you got time for a titty fuck after that granola bar and, you know uh. and um all right can you say granola bar on this podcast and so um and so uh, I started prank calling my buddy who she had a crush on as her because I realized I could do her voice like I just oh. my voice hadn't dropped and she had this really like raspy like and I could do it to a T so my buddies and I would call my other buddy Evan and pretend to be her and talk for like I mean kind of diabolical when you think about it but we thought it was hilarious and uh, I'm beginning and it, to think you're pretty diabolical <laughs> yeah, listening yeah, to yeah. all this it's yeah, like yeah, for wow sure. for sure all right. but it was truly just for the sake of of comedy we didn't we never pulled any you know malicious um you know, yeah. uh, we didn't orchestrate anything like, hey, you know, sit didn't on the grass and like, grab my tits. Like, we didn't, you know, yeah. didn't do anything really uh, insane with, in hindsight. But again, that gave me this, like, just seeing people laugh like that just felt good. And also, truly, you know, I was known as, like, the fat kid, right? And so once you start making people laugh, Can't for me, that. I go, oh, it was, it was pretty awful. And even, like, some of your best friends teasing you, it was, like, just so... And my mom, you know, had weight issues growing up, so she always said, I never wanted to give you... A complex about it or bust your balls because uh, I did not and she was did she use those terms yeah bust your balls yeah yeah, yeah just <laughs> you know sweet Jew from Oklahoma just uh, <laughs> my mom has all sorts of catchphrases now like yikeroonies 
basically means like, you know, fuck the pasta salad, you know, or, um, <laughs> you know, what's, uh, I, uh, uh, what is she? Um, An Oki Jew, I love Oki it. Oki Jew, yeah. yeah. But so she uh, was like, I didn't want to tell you to, to get your act together because, uh, you know, I, you seemed happy and I was happy. Again, until you get people, you know, really uh, calling attention to it. And so when I started making people laugh, they were like, um, sorry, I thought that's, that was an ice cream truck right. for a minute. My eyes lit up, you know. It's the fat kid in me. And so uh, <laughs> I started making people laugh, and I was the funny kid, not the fat kid. How did and you- then that, so then you're like, oh, I'm going to chase that because people are seeing me in a different light. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that was truly, I think, the where it started. How did, how did your uh, mother handle it? I mean, the fact that you were not going to become a uh, whatever, doctor, lawyer. Doctor, lawyer. I don't think she truly cared she always wanted to be an actress but my Ah, grandpa rest his soul said in a very like not encouraging but not discouraging way like are you gonna be able to support yourself doing that Mm -hmm. and that kind of to her was like all right like i don't know so i guess i'll be a social worker help you know work with assisted living homes get my um you know uh uh bachelor's and and uh you know, in social work and, and, um, and she, you know, family counseling and therapy and just did a bunch of different things while it was just me and her, uh, after my folks split and they, uh, thanks for bringing it up. And they, um, uh, <laughs> so they were, they were supportive. <laughs> yeah, they were supportive, but she, she wanted to act all the time so that, and she's gotten to now actually later in life, uh, being married to my stepdad, you know, who was doing okay. And so he was like, once I got married, he was like, stop working four jobs and go do all these acting classes that you want to do these workshops, whatever. And so she started doing it nonstop for a minute. Um, Where is this? In Seattle. Oh, okay. And she even did the vagina monologues like, I want to say six times. Wow. And then she stopped. And then a, a, um, a playhouse in uh, uh, Edmonds, Washington called her up and ha- asked her to come do it because they heard she did it in all these other <laughs> productions. So she came out of retirement. I was like, Mom, you're like the Brett Favre of vagina monologues. <laughs> and truly, you don't know. They you. Yeah, you. Yeah, she just couldn't stay away from the game. You truly don't know what it's like to know, a, know like what it's like to just see your, your parent go from parent to person when you see your mom do a really intense monologue about her vagina. Like it was, and she didn't do like one of the fun, funny ones. It was kind of dark. And what was great was that like her acting was like surprisingly and also not surprisingly phenomenal because she's such a compassionate, vulnerable, just c- amazing at connecting, listening person. So I was not surprised at how How did you great feel about that? But hearing her being like, my pussy was flooding with, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but it was <laughs> yeah. like, all I heard was like, fucking my sloppy vagina. Like, it was just, I was like sitting there with my sister and my sister's like, I never thought we'd be here. I'm like, me neither, but uh, she's happy. Fuck, what is happening? That's why you you have a, a pretty ex- <laughs> extensive, uh, what's the word, resume. Yeah. You, but again, it, so she, you know, she, and she lived oh, like Let's stay with her, me. okay. She, she always helped out with the high school plays and everything. And again, because she always wanted to do it. So being around that world. Well, where did she come from, your mother? Was uh, she, that she Ada, had that Oklahoma, interest? which is about three hours east of Oklahoma City in a did very ever, small town. Did she ever tell you why or how she had that interest or yeah just I mean as I started to get into it I think that's how supportive she was and I think she also look, you can kind of tell like early on like I would do like the plays and Cub Scouts and things like that and I just I I don't want to use the word like I was a natural but I just wasn't there you know you stick out more so if everyone around you sucks too you know so I was okay <laughs> but yeah. everyone else was dog shit so it was like who's this kid like well, I've it, never seen a cowardly lion ask for ice cream cake when he got to Oz instead of courage, but this kid's improvising, you know? It, it sounds like you really kind of knew from coming out of the womb in terms of uh, I think so. what, what you wanted to do and that this, this was kind of like your calling. Totally, but I, I also wasn't that kid, because then I've heard stories of kids that were like, yeah, from the get-go, I was the kid that made everybody laugh at the family dinners or whatever, and it's like, I was not that at all. In fact, I was so shy almost at home because the family stuff was always so weird and broken and so at school is truly where I uh that's why I liked school because it was like man when I'm home I'm around all this heavy shit and it's like when I go to school I'm just like I as a default found myself being more just having a A more of a zest for life and just more up and and friendly and so that's kind of how I was 
all through middle school and high school. And so people were always like, oh, you're just so, and I've kind of carried that on more or less. And this business obviously, obviously uh, beats it out of you a little bit. But, just, well, but being optimistic and, and glass half full, I try to maintain that as much as possible. You well, know? you do. It, it's, you, you always have a good attitude. Yeah. It doesn't matter what's going on. It's uh, the, when, you, when you're at home, it's life. You're, you're facing life, yeah. um, you know, when you get out of it, it it's uh, kind of like me coming to work or anybody going to work. Yeah. It's like you don't have to deal with the actual day to day financial stuff, um, relationship stuff, all that. It's so going anywhere in your case, like, uh, you know, doing stand up, doing acting work and all. Yeah. It, it's it a can be distracted. Yeah. You know, but also I found a, a you know. A real passion for it but and you can still let some of the issues from wherever else in your life exist seep into work and and play but you know you you try not to like there was towards the end of high school before my mom met my stepdad and I was you know I started to really kind of be more social and was going to parties and this and that and you know a lot of the times I wouldn't even I'd be leaving to go out on a Friday night and I'd see my mom just sitting there by herself like watching TV and I was like, ah, fuck. Like, you know, you just, you start to also shift from seeing your parent as a parent uh, to a person. So mm -hmm. you're like, God, like now I have, like, I feel bad that she's here by herself. And she was so just like, go oh, get my again. But I was like, no, nah, I'm going to stay and I, it's just a party, whatever. Like, let's go see a movie or just hang out with her, get dinner or whatever. And so that stuff too, like, you know, you don't know it in the moment, but you're like, oh, okay, these little like, Little just, moments with your mother or, or whatever, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and just also shifts in, um, you know, I don't know, just allowing for, uh, you know, to to enjoy that stuff, which obviously everybody talks about. You try to do that more as you get older with yeah. your family, but it's true because you, you don't you don't really realize when you're young, like you know, that your parents are people. No, nah, so. everybody's invincible to yeah, you. Yeah, and and your your parents are like they're going to be there forever. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not true. But so when, as you get older, you realize mortality is there. Yeah. And so like you go like, all right, you know, I, maybe I better spend a couple of minutes yeah. or, or a day or whatever if I've moved away with, with my parents. Yeah, totally. And it's gotten less and less as I go home that I will go out. And now it's a thing too where, you know, when I used to go back in college, I would just, you know, you meet up with all your friends and you're trying to rehash old memories and just kind of keep some of that old stuff alive as everyone's starting to kind of move off and do their own thing. And my high school girlfriend married my, you know, uh, childhood best friend and they fucking <laughs> kind of did it behind my back, even though I didn't give a fuck, which was weird. And then I made a cartoon about it to kind of deal with some of the, you know, the issues, anxiety yeah. about it. I was like, oh, well, I'm a comedian. What's the benefit of doing what I do? I'll take something that was kind of weird, not tragic, but just uh, somewhat emotional because I was definitely suppressing how I felt about it because they, whatever. So I made this funny cartoon where it was, my buddy animated, where it was me giving a speech if I did go to their wedding, right? And because um, my buddy called me and he was like, hey, man, I, uh, you know, I, we're having the wedding at, by the way, her like cabin that she and I used to always go to all through high school. And I'm just like, he's like, I want, I was, you know, which one of my friends was like, you got to come. I was like, I'm not going. Like, that's just weird. Like, I used to fucking, we fuck, we, we fucked all over this cabin, you know? And he's just like, you got to come. He's like, dude, we'll just sneak off in the woods and get high. It'll be great. I'm like, do you realize how awful this yeah. pitch sounds? Just get <laughs> right? high at my ex's wedding with all the family that I know. And I'm just like, and, and, and this is the place we did it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So he calls me and he's like, I got to your name on the list. And I thought. I want to invite him, but I don't know if he's going to show up and badmouth me while I'm there. I go, Evan, the fact that you would think that I would show up to your wedding and talk shit means just says it all, dude. I go, I wish you the best. Yeah. Definitely not going. I go, I do have the weekend open. I will figure out some way to fill it. But like <laughs> coming to your, like I would rather, you know, hang out with my sister's cat. And if you know me well, which you don't because we haven't talked in a while and you're fucking my ex, that I hate cats. So that should tell you how much I don't want to come to this celebration. But good on you and have a great life. So I made this cartoon of me giving a speech at the wedding if I went. And it was very... Very silly, very, I flew in on a rocket pack. I grabbed her grandma and made out with her. And then I was like, oh man, great to be here. Never thought I'd be here. Well, I did at one point, but I thought I'd be, yeah, whatever. So anyway, you know. And, and by uh, the way, buddy, my my uh, DNA is all over yeah, this cabin. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it like got, it didn't go viral or anything, but like, you know, the, this is also very early into YouTube, I think. This was maybe, I want to say 2007, 2008, you know? Mm -hmm. So there wasn't so much content for people to consume to where if a video went up on Facebook and something like there's, 
people could get to stuff a little uh, with a little more accessibility, and so it definitely circulated around our friends, her family, and man, they pretty yeah, much. They, I got so many emails. You fucking asshole! Like, <laughs> how dare you make this like and be happy for her? I'm like, I am happy for her. like. It's also not real, like right. It's a cartoon. I mean, it was so silly, but they just you know people, people again do like that. they. Everyone, uh, even the sweetest of people, at some there's some piece of everyone that wants to, wants you know gets excited about the idea of getting upset about something. You know, you go home. You you do go up to Seattle. I try quite to. A bit. You have. I've watched a couple of the little videos you put on Facebook with your nieces. Oh yeah, they are like the cutest things. They're the in greatest. The world. Now they're turning into uh, little girls, little so. bitches. Yeah, but they're uh, <laughs> girls. Yeah, for sure. It's called growing up. Yeah. No, they. I mean, dude. Even just the other, last time I was home, one of them was like, "I'm glad I have hair down there now." I was like, "Cool." I just asked where you want to go to lunch, but you know, I guess <laughs> my oh, little yeah, Toys right. R Us kid wants to eat at Hooters now. Is that what that means? But what they're a- they're like. You know, they had they had no dad the first four years. So that's why I was going back a lot because I want to make sure they had a male influence that was around that uh-huh. wasn't my stepdad. God bless him. Just not getting on the ground and, you know, playing the Play, way yeah. that Uncle Adam does. And so, and I just, you know, there were the first kids, you know, grandkids in the fam. And I just, I don't know, I just, you know, um, just yeah. flocked to them. And, and they just, I just had a deeper sense of connection with them. Again, because they, the dad wasn't in the picture. Where- and, um where did all these uh, voices that you do come from? In in the know. sense that you know, it's like, and I don't know exact exact. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. Well, I had had enough of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't want. I, yeah, yeah. Well, he doesn't want me to cry in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I've watched these videos with. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're not that good. With no, they are. They actually, yeah. they're a lot of fun. <laughs> well, some of the early videos are the fun ones because that's when they were like three and four, and I literally would just sit them on either um, uh, uh, leg and just you know. They didn't know they were being filmed, and I would just kind of interview them about certain things. And their answers were, and they're twins, so they have this, like, you know, just locked in connection where they're just kind of in sync with each other. And as I've gotten older, their personalities are pretty awesome. And they pitch me jokes, and they, they're still at an age two where it's very, they're, they're, you know, I'm definitely having to play bad cop more because I'm always so fun and do all the cool shit. And now they've gotten that comfy, but they're starting to act in certain ways where, you're like, all right, well, I don't want you to I be care smoking about this dope at the age of totally. uh, eight. <laughs> and I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I want to encourage whatever <laughs> the good things about them. And then, and you want to let people develop and shape the way they're going to. But I would be doing them a disservice if I didn't take advantage of how much they do listen and look up to me and chime in. So I've kind of, you know, become this additional parent. And it's, you know, there's times when I've had to really like lay in on them and, and, uh, and give them like, you know, kind of some truth bombs about, if they're complaining about some things. I'm like, you guys, I mean, even last time I was home, I had to give them a whole, like, you don't know how lucky you are type thing. Like, there's kids that don't even get to even see a swimming pool. And you're complaining about how we didn't get to stay there long or we didn't get to after we just did this and then this and really try to break it down without, you know, also. You're going to be I, a good father. I can see that. <laughs> this is going to be like, I've you know. i made him cry a few times. That's okay. But even my nephew, Kids who's five, cry. I mean, I fucking, he smacked my niece in the back of her head so hard. And this kid's got freakish, like, strength. And, um, you know, like, there's, like, there was this kid in my high school named Tyler, right? And he had Down syndrome. And he just fucking was the strongest kid ever, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, my nephew has that type of strength where you just don't see it coming, you know? Because Tyler was, like, short. He wore a leather jacket. But then he'd do backflips and had nunchucks and fucking punched the <laughs> security guard once. And the security guard went down, like, immediately. And we're like, dude, did Wait, you know this, Tyler had fucking this, is this Seattle? amazing retarded strength? What's that? Seattle? Seattle, baby. Yeah, like Forest Park, Washington. And so wow. Jackson, my nephew, slapped my niece in the back. And I'm like... And it was so hard. And she went down, and, and, my, and I went at him, and, and, and he cried and ran away. And then, like, got in my face and was like, like you know, because his dad's a, a rapper, and he's white, and he's not Eminem. But he's got a, you know, a, a complex, seeing his pops be so tough and intimidating. And my mom's like, you can't lay into him like that. He's only, he's only been on the planet for five years. I go, I get that, Mom. But also, like, he's got to know, and I know he does. Like, if you don't reprimand him at some point for, like, smacks that are right. that hard, like... He's going, he's going to have doing four it. domestic abuse charges by the time he's 15. You have a sitcom right here. I know. Well, you know? dude, trust me. There's, there's a show built around all this that, uh, that you're that writing. My boy, Divine, that I've written, that 
Divine is on board with, but you know that guy's got a million projects, so it's taken its time to, to That's, reach the uh, surface. Adam Divine. Adam Divine. Yeah, one of my best buds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know him from uh, Workaholics. You know him from Workaholics. I was trying to find a really small lesser credit to make a joke of, but I couldn't oh. think of one because all he does <laughs> is gold. Taco yeah. Bell. You know him from Taco Bell commercials, but. Even that filled the pockets. Oh, and what's the commercial he did where they ripped his hair off? The, oh, uh, the uh, State Farm or Allstate? Oh, whatever the heck that Best was. Best Buy. I remember him telling me, he was like, gosh, should I do this Best Buy commercial? And I was like, I mean, yeah, dude, do it. Mm -hmm. Like, And then he was like, it's kind of funny. I was like, if it's kind of funny, of course do it. Also, you, look at Shaq, dude. He's doing Papa oh, John's yeah. now. I mean, I cannot wait till I get to a point to where like Jamba Juice is just like, so, like dude, will you... Yeah, here's a million bucks, you know. I mean, just do, do a little campaign. Just do it, man, for a little bit. Also, you, it, same thing with game shows. You look at it, the business is totally changing where there's nothing that's, it's not considered, you know, not cool to be right. on these. I think I saw the, Ryan Reynolds on a fucking, was that a Sprint commercial or an anal beads fucking oh. ad? Some sort of thing. They were pushing something. On well, the public now, it, it like you said, it's it's not a negative to do those yeah. as a, a well-respected actor. It, it's all part of the game. It's an up and down biz, man. If you're getting those opportunities, clearly something's going right. Look at Tiffany Haddish, man. Fucking yeah, you know, there's there's not, uh, not oh, a cool opportunity coming her way. No, good for her. Yeah, I love Tiffany. The um, uh, it made me lo lose my thought. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now you guys... You were asking about uh, uh, my nieces. What was I doing? Your nieces? My voices. Oh, yes, your voices. That's not what I was going to ask about. Uh, <laughs> but uh, speaking of those, wh where'd you come up with Slimer? How did you come up with that? Oh, I mean, man. did you see the, the cartoon first? And yeah, the yeah, for sure. I loved the Go Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters cartoon. I think I'd probably seen that before I saw the movie. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, because I think the original movie came out, what, late 80s? Yeah, somewhere I think back I might, there, yeah, yeah, so I think the cartoon, but I just, it was, you know, I didn't have somebody to, to put it in front of me, but um, obviously now a classic, one of my faves. But so when I did the heat with Paul Feig and then he gave me a little part in Spy, and so just kind of got to be real chummy with them and did our podcast a few times and, you know, go to some holiday parties with them and, and um, dinners every now and then and, and just a real good dude and... and he, Let me interrupt you. Since you mentioned podcasts, yeah. I want everybody to know oh, yeah. that you're, you know, about last about night. About last night. Go check it, it out. Your podcast, because you have some Eddie's episode great, was incredible. Great people. Oh, you're in good company. You. We've had, yeah, Sandra Bullock, Dana Carvey, uh, Saget, uh, Bill Burr, uh, Neil Patrick Harris, uh, yeah, it's Dr. A, it, Oz. It's a, had. it's a great podcast. Thanks, man. I've actually you were great. listened to, oh. I just, <laughs> I just follow you. That's it. You're still, you we guys, got so many. You, I should forward you some of the emails we got about your episode. It was really? Pretty great. Yeah, we get we get a bunch after every one. You, you and Brad doing that together for me. Yeah. It was like I had no idea what it was going to be like. Yeah. And that's kind of good sometimes to go yeah, completely. Yeah. Well, that's what I do, if I do any us. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It's I did Eddie Ifs at one point right. too. Like his was the first one that I did, and you guys is the was were this was the second one, but you. Eddie Ifs was different. You guys, the questions and how you asked them, you know, made me very comfortable. Oh, good. It, it, like, it just kind of led from one thing to another. Yeah. Rather than, like, what I'm doing here. No, this is great. Going from where, no, but you listen wherever again. I go. And you also want to keep that loose. And, like, Brad and I try to keep it the way it is, like, when we hang out, that you're, and that's what people, I think, enjoy is that they feel like they're a fly on the walls to the conversation to where they could, literally you know be sitting in the room or also at the table and feel like they could chime in at any moment with something to say and we you know don't want it to feel so just down the right. uh, line like an interview, interview chat show yeah. yeah which it you know is ultimately but um there's a way to keep it fun and but organic it, it, yeah we also try to keep again in mind that it's a comedy show so even there's times where we've felt you know, even when we had Marin on and he talked pretty candidly about, you know, suicide and, and uh, uh, you know, thoughts at that point in his life when things were kind of going down and, and it got kind of dark for a minute. Like, I made a joke to kind of lighten the mood. And then he, like, made a joke at me for, like, making a joke about this, like, heartfelt, you know, kind of moment, moment yeah. like we just had. And uh, and that was really fun and, and kind of turned things around. But it's just, again, like, being... Being it's present, and Brad and I listen really well too, and that's what yeah. you get when you've been around somebody that long. And well, the, I I call it I've made up a word, and it's called conversate. Yeah, and that's what 
I call this because it's like, to me, it's not an interview. We're just talking. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, I come up with these stupid questions, but at the same time, or stupid. change subjects. There's been I one stupid question so far. <laughs> oh, well, see, but. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, Had you it, met a little person before you'd met Brad? Or were you, did that take you by surprise? Because oh, the no. amount of people in my apartment complex that would see him walk in like two to three times a week, I mean, like. It just the looks of people in the pool or in the pad. I mean, because there's no other dwarves coming through that complex. So it's literally, and everyone was like, dude, what is. And then I think once people start to see some, you know, comedians and some famous people roll through, they're like, oh, there must be some sort of a, a well, show have, or something going on. But I have, I, yeah, circus. Yeah, circus. Because even, dude, even my old roommate before he met Brad, you know, Brad rolled in and, and um, you know, I talk about this on, on stage sometimes where. Yeah, you know, my roommate and I were sitting there smoking a joint, and Brad, he had met Brad. We just started doing the podcast, and he gets up to go to the bathroom, and Brad comes in, and, uh, and I was sitting in a new chair. I got and I was Brad, you got to sit in this chair, man. Like, check it out. I'm going to get some snacks. I go in the kitchen. Brad's sitting where I'm sitting. Roommate comes back. He's pretty baked. He just sees Brad, takes a beat, and he's like, Adam? <laughs> and here's how great of a comic and even better person Brad is. He recognizes what's happening and just goes, starts touching himself and he goes, what happened to me? <laughs> and, uh, and then he was like, wait, what the fuck's going on here? And then I came out and I was like, that's my buddy Brad. He was like, Jesus Christ, I thought, you know. Well, to answer your question, Brad was not the first little person okay, good. I saw. But when I, when I came over to your apartment to do the podcast, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of funny he just came down the stairs to let me in. And it was oh, yeah. like, oh, wow. I, I would always tell Brad people when they I come, I was Brad. like, just look for the dwarf at the front. He's, yeah, he's no, it, be. but you guys were, you guys, yeah, you it was a great blast. podcast. Yeah, you, you've had all sports guys too. And yeah, we just had on Richard Jefferson and Blake Griffin and Gary Payton and, um, you know, God. hopefully going to get on Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, who we, you know, met and then got to do the Celebrity All-Star Game, which was so cool. You, you uh, played in the Celebrity yeah. All-Star Game, Did you, if you call that playing. But, I had uh, nine points, two yeah, rebounds, I took yeah. a charge. You know, I, I watched it only because you and Brad were in it. Good. Otherwise, I would have just kept going. I know, it's going. a whatever game. But, but it, it was like, it's kind of fun because I, I in past years... I've watched it because Michael Rappaport. Yes, just it, had him on. So good. Who, who uh, Michael does And it's here all the time now. Yeah. That's going to be so cool for you, right? He's doing, well, you know, I've known Michael since he was 16 years saying, old. Yeah. yeah it, oh, it, since 16? Oh, when he first came. Is that when he first started, like, hosting here? No. Well, you know who his uh, mother is. and his, No, you don't. No. His, um, his mother is Joanne Astro. His stepfather is Mark Lano. Wow. Um, so he came out here. I'm not 100% sure about this, you know, to stay with them for a summer or whatever. Yeah. And uh, he just used to hang out here as this little, no, little, he's this big New York teenager hanging out with like, yo, Eddie, what you, can we put the Knicks on? Yeah. You know, oh and stuff God. like that. So New York. Probably oh. even more so back then than he is now, right? Oh, he right? was. He's, he's yeah. lost a lot of his uh, New York accent yeah. or worked on it, whatever. But <laughs> Worked on his, it. Yeah. He, uh, he, he's, he was a trip. We, we had, a, uh, I don't want to call it an incident, and I've talked about this before, I think, with Mark. He, was, he uh, was sitting over in the restaurant, Michael, and the basketball game is on, and there's maybe half a dozen people having dinner. And all of a sudden, it goes, yo, fucking shit, you missed that <laughs> shot. It was a layup. <laughs> Everybody turns Dead around silent. and goes Record like, scratch. what yeah. in the world? Yeah, yeah. I go over to him. I said, Michael, I said, there are people here eating. Yeah. You really can't do that. And he goes like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Eddie. I, I really didn't. I, I, you know, I won't do it again. About half an hour later, he comes over to me and goes, you know, Eddie, I really appreciate the fact that, that you came over to me and told me. Everybody else goes to Mark and tells Mark I'm, I do something or whatever. Dang. You know, it was so it, it, was, it was a nice moment. I don't know that uh, he'd remember that. Yeah. But it, it's, uh, he, he's great. He's, on, he's also on every radio show, sports oh, yeah. show. Well, that's another guy that's truly uh, found it. You know, as you get on in this business and you realize, especially as an actor, that there's other ways to be heard and seen. And he's kind of, you know, he's also always been, and you can probably really attest to this, had a, you know, a thirst for getting his opinion out there and being <laughs> and talking. Yeah. You know, from what I've heard, he's been that chatty all the time. So 
the podcast forum and uh, stand up is like Perfect know, almost kind of built for him. Well, he did stand up back then. I don't know if it was quite when he was 16, but as he started getting a little older, uh, and he was not that good. Yeah. <laughs> he is so it took a good. He's, he's really developed now. And he's because I walked in and watched him a couple of times. But even uh, people that I know that saw him when he started doing it go like, he's like a different person yeah. altogether. Well, that's also what's great about stand up is you can't replace the work. Like, you have to get reps and you have to, there's only one way to. Remember, I my, MySpace messaged Patton Oswalt when I was like a year in, like, any shortcuts? I think I'm, I did the belly room at the comedy store once. I think I'm ready for a special. And he was just like, I'm going to tell you, no offense, I had some sketch that was on the front page of, of MySpace, and he knew my friend, so that's why I had the, the chutzpah to even message him. And he was like, don't take this personal, but I'm going to give you the response that I copy and paste and send to any young comic that asked me. And it was like, get up, write all the time, control what you can control, other stuff's going to happen when it's supposed to happen, but just get funny and just keep doing, mm -hmm. like, get up. That's really the only, and, and yeah. it was simple, but it was also like, all right, cool, that is... I guess the, the formula, the way, yeah. there's no shortcut, there's no, the, and I've in turn had to throw that on friends from college that start trickling uh, into that world and, and they'll do maybe stand up for six months and four shows a month, you know, but they're all big, they, all of them are getting all their friends and, and they all go well because you have all your friends and you are, you know, funny enough and it's only eight to ten minutes and then they're like, dude, I'm, how do I get, pat so, I, can I, you know, how do I get up at the improv and the flat laugh back? How do I, you know, and I'm just like, dude, you're not well, I, even close. Like, okay, wait, so come you, back to me in five more years? I don't know. How did you get up at the improv? Well, before I, I ask you that question, somebody's getting their hair cut upstairs. Yeah, we, so yeah, just so yeah. you know where, where that buzz is <laughs> yeah. coming from. But how did you start at the improv? How did you get up here at the improv? I, well, Go I ahead and answer you, your phone. No, can I plug this in, actually? Yeah. Do you have a charger back there? I do. Answer okay, that. I'll, I'll put it on. Um... Anyway, how did you first get up here at the improv? So I, um, should we stop for that? No? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I came here, I think, and did a, an open mic, and then I did Adam Devine's fifth year show, right? They had a fifth year show that was like late Saturday night. Okay. It was with the Lampoon, it was oh, kind yeah. of mm -hmm. produced with the Lampoon guys that he was working with, and then, um... And then I think I got past, I met Matt Komen, uh, the old booker, mm -hmm. uh, who now, you know, is uh, one of my best buds, runs, uh, you know, all the West Palm Improv and Stand Up Live, Tempe Improv, Copper Blues, all that. And oh, uh, wow. Didn't even he know got that. me, oh yeah, and he's uh, crushing it down there and got me, got me a few spots here. And he was doing a, working for a website called Comedy Time, which was trying to be like a new funnier die. And, and so we did a couple videos, did one that was like a Jersey Shore it was me playing an Italian executive that was commenting on all the flack that Jersey Shore was getting for making fun of Italian Americans. And it was just, I was just a super guido guy that was like, everyone's been talking about Jersey Shore and like basically fuck you. And like, this is guy. And that video went viral and then it got featured on, they did something with Jersey Shore because the show was so popular where it was just the cast watching videos that was poking fun at them. And so that one got featured. That was the first time I was ever on TV was that, Actually, the first time I was ever on TV was when I was drunk and high, and I rushed the stage at The Price is Right and I, uh, during the showcase showdown. And when the guy won, and I rushed, we went with 25 dudes from my frat. You were guaranteed one person to get called to contestant's row if you had 20 or more people. Our guy got called at the very end, and it was a million dollar show. It was 2003 when Bob wow. Barker was still hosting, but it was at 8 p.m. It was prime time Price is Right. They'd never done this. So the prizes weren't just like dinette sets and fucking, uh, you know, um, a roulette table and, a, you know, uh, a fucking kitchen knives. It was like the opening prizes were like an Escalade and a toaster that jerks you off and fucking a trip to Tahiti. <laughs> and so right out of the gate, we're like, this is going to be amazing. Our buddy only gets one chance to get called up. So we're like, what a waste of a day. My buddy's like, you should rush the stage for whoever wins. Pushes me out of my seat. I run down the fucking come on down carpet. I get. I walk up the stairs. You can't see on TV. There's a security guard standing at the top of the stage. All she does is go, you can't go up here. And I just go, that's my best friend in the whole world. And she goes, all right. And I run by her. <laughs> I'm dancing with his fucking friends. I'm rubbing his head. I sat in his Escalade and pretended to drive it at one point. I, the end of the shot, I talked about this on stage. And actually, I taped the whole story and with video. And it's on uh, my YouTube page. Uh, so I have an Adam Ray Price's right story. But at the end of the, when Bob Barker's like, don't forget to get your 
cut off your dog's clits and dicks or whatever he fucking says. I'm standing behind Bob Barker, like doing the robot. And then I give a, a double thumbs up like, holy shit, like right behind him. So that was the first time I was on TV. But then this Jersey Shore thing was the second time. And uh, anyway, Matt Coleman got me up at the improv. And uh, but it was only every three or four months. It wasn't a lot because yeah. there are just so many, you know, you know, once you're starting out, there's only so many spots to go around. Yeah, but you got up. And that's but I got up thing. and like, getting a little taste of a good show was cool. And then I met a few, um, you know, if, if bigger guys <coughs> were headlining on a night, I could do a little guest spot. And then Mark Saratella. He's now become one of my best buds. Uh, well, the guy came up who from San Diego. T- the guy who never drinks. told me that, that we had, had a, a bar tab for our show for four <laughs> years. And so that I always was paying for my drinks and then because the tab was always out. So that's why you I don't think you ever brought it up because the tab was out. So you were just like, right, you, there's no reason to tell me. You just thought that I got there late. And I was like, all right, now I'll buy and the I drinks. I always thought you knew. I thought You Mark always took care of me too to anyway. You. But like, yeah, you just thought I knew. <laughs> four years later, I'm just like. Mark, dude, and so now it's a running joke. He's like, oh, Mark, I, I mean, have you paid? Did you buy Adam lunch today and for the rest of his life? I you, can't believe when I first told you this. Or, or like, oh, the look on my face. Oh, Priceless. yeah. And, and Mark is standing there like. <laughs> yeah, dude, I know. I, and he's like, like, I thought you knew. And also, he knew, too. So it was, but, what, you know, what are you going to do? And so, uh, but so we started that show here to basically get stage time here. Yeah. Meet other comics. Most people do. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, it's, and it truly is a brilliant thing to do if you're I think Mark was maybe eight or nine years in and I was three years in and so it was cool and we both had n- known a, a handful of people that we could get and also it just turned in uh, and me being out here with friends from college and improv classes and acting classes and 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 working at Universal Studios it was like I had a, a lot of different pockets of people to pull from to be like if we do a show one night I can get a lot of people here what year uh did you first get up here do you remember so I so again I graduated in 2005 and didn't do any stand up between 2005. I was doing only uh, improv and sketch at the Groundlings, and then I went to New York uh, with a girlfriend for five or six months to maybe live there, but live with her while she was um, uh, working in the Page program at NBC, and um, and then she moved to Reno and fucked the cameraman and we broke up. And so uh, <laughs> uh, great story. Again, that is Very also a cartoon history, on it. YouTube. I made a song with Avery Pearson called Reno Cheater, and it's on YouTube. And the song is catchy. And it and the Are guy you saw. Sure, it. you're not Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh my God. I am the male Taylor yeah, Swift. I'm are you Mailer kidding Swift. Me? There you go. I love that. Hey, why not? Mailer Tiff. You have yeah. you have that outlet. I do. But when, again, like, yeah, like why if you're not taking advantage of I feel like it's such a blessing to get conditioned after a while to go, oh man, when something heavy or negative starts to uh, you know, fill your day, like you got to uh, as quick as you can find you know the silver lining or the 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 funny in it, and so right. and obviously like time, you know is uh, is on your side for that. But if you can, you know it, it makes everything better. But performing here was probably two thousand eight or nine. And what what I always which is crazy. That's like add, ten years now. Yeah. So, well, you've been doing so that's how long I've known you. Now, yeah. yeah? Uh, I always ask people this. It, it's like, what was your feeling when you first? Was was the improv stage like a, a magical thing for oh, you yeah. at the beginning? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, all the here. evening at the improvs, and you know, uh, just it's funny how much you look back and go, "Oh, I knew like not a ton about the history of of comedy, but I just seen so much." And I, once you get a little bit of interest, even like doing, you know, the first uh, open mic in Seattle. Before that, I definitely just. Uh, you know, whether it was VHSs or whatever, or at the library, like finding things, or I had a, a, a friend's a dad who had a bunch of old tapes from improv things or HBO specials. And even that, like, got me just to know that, like, comedy clubs were a thing, but I truly only knew that this was, like, the place to, to do it, which was another factor in me wanting to come to LA for, for acting school so that I could be near this and it wouldn't be like a, you know, I would have to start in. I mean, all the great acting schools are in cities where the yeah. arts are prominent, but, um, but yeah, it, it was definitely, it was intimidating for sure, and because I also had come to a lot of shows here before I even started, just to watch, and because I was in that limbo period where I, and I do this in the, at the factory um, and the store too, where I just wanted to go and, and just, just be, uh, you know, and just feel the room and just be there and, and start to kind of fantasize about 
being in this world and being on stage and and I'd see the comics interacting, you know, and probably even, you know, I'm sure with you and and getting jealous but excited at the idea of like I want to be in that I want to mm-hmm. be comfortable here, you know. And then once you realize what it takes, <clears throat> uh that's when you have to make a choice cuz you know, my uh girlfriend at that time, you know, uh uh, the fucking the camera, the camera guy. guy. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up, Eddie. Jesus Christ. I and uh, I, I, that just came out. I don't <laughs> yeah, know where, where yeah, I got, where that I got from. it from. But yeah. that actually was you like. You should make a cartoon of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that was a turning point because then it gave me an extra boost of like, well, now I have nothing holding me back other than me. And because and, there's this point where you recognize, again, what is required of this whole business. And some people jump right in. They just don't even think twice. I was just talking to Mark Norman uh, on the podcast about that. And he just. Just always was just didn't even think twice about how hard it was and moved to New York from New Orleans with a girl he'd been dating for 12 years and then cheated on her and then that ended and he just but he was just balls to the wall the whole time and I definitely knew that it was like you have to give yourself over to it drive to Santa Barbara for eight minutes take a train to San Diego but you know really just invest in yourself and do whatever it takes it's a process. so that gave me a lot of uh I just, I kept going back and forth with being like, do I want to do that? Do I want to skip all my friends' birthday parties <laughs> and from college and all the social hangs, which I enjoyed, and stop being in a kickball league that I was in on Mondays because I'm going to wait for four hours at the comedy store to get up on the open mic. And so once you make that switch and you go, yeah, I'm going to... And then once I got into it, it was like, you know, I, I stopped... Once I start, started not feeling bad about, are you coming to this party? Yeah, no, I, I I'm doing this... Sh- show and people would be like oh come on it's just a one it's one show and that always like stuck with me where i was like i know but i i because i didn't do it once i skipped one show once and went to a party and i felt so guilty about it and so i was like no i'm not doing that again like that if i'm gonna do this i gotta like go all in and i gotta i felt like i was cheating myself and and cheating what i could you know uh what i was capable of and and also the party was shit it wasn't even a friend i cared about that much (laughs) i just the the idea of hanging and being in girls and also you know in the early 20s you're just like and that was the first taste of really being out in la and 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 partying in la because at sc you know you got college parties and whatnot and i came up to la truly like you know hollywood and, and anywhere outside of downtown la maybe 20 times over the four years to go to UCLA to a frat party or to Diddy Reese or up here I think I went to the standard for a party once but it was very seldom because I had so much you know the theater program again was you know extremely demanding so I didn't have a lot of time to leave and when I did have time I wanted to hang and I and also I enjoyed the college experience uh, socially uh, um, so people don't realize the the process the commitment yeah. that anybody I guess in any art has to make a, Same, a thousand percent. Yeah, you you have to dedicate yourself. If you do not, then you're not putting a hundred percent in it. Doesn't mean you're not going to make it. It that's because there's no rhyme or reason. Yep. But the you fact- have to give yourself a fair shot to like to win, and and that yeah. includes. It's like if I like I just played my sister's twentieth high school reunion, and you know she only went to the first year of high school and then got into some trouble and then went to an all girl school in Utah and so we were never there at the same time but I know a lot of the people she grew what up kind with of family do you have it's, Fuck like, it. it's you crazy keep dude telling me like it's and this crazy. is in Seattle Washington yeah it sounds like Seattle is not all hippies and coffee York, and Microsoft you know? and Amazon it's, like, it's a lot of fucked up stepkids put your and, sister away in some <laughs> school somewhere yeah, and, and your nieces you gotta make them cry <laughs> it, it's gotta rap your, her brother-in-law yeah, yeah. Your, your mother wants to be an actress which I love yeah. it's like you know, it's a, there's a lot going on, Eddie. Every you think any, you know, good <laughs> comedian actor is made up of just like the normal, absolutely you know, Green not. Acres modern family. Absolutely, I know yeah. enough of you guys, and, <laughs> yeah. and I've been but it around is truly. This. You, it's funny when you do even on a podcast, which I think is the best way to do it. Like get to know because we're hanging at the clubs, like unless it's like late night here and there's not a lot of distractions to yeah. truly like get invested in a conversation even in the halls or here it's just all on the surface and Mm -hmm. sometimes a little bit more like you know I've definitely had chats back there with people that get kind of but there's always and I think you know it uh you know instinctively that there's always at any moment someone's gonna come out of the bathroom and and uh you know cock block a a sentiment Mm. heartfelt moment or, or there's gonna be something to I'm gonna choke yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah don't die on this podcast. Upstairs. Or maybe do this but this episode could go viral, you know? Yeah, this yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. The the um I think it's the dust. It's that dust, huh? <coughs> Excuse me. 
me, guys. Um, what were we talking about? Now that I, I have no voice, you, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got something in my throat. If you just start crying. Yes, I'm going to tear up <laughs> and cry yeah. all because of the fact that <laughs> yeah. you, have, so, you have this thug family. <laughs> but so I played this I'm reu- learning about. I want to tell you about playing the reunion, the okay. 20 year reunion. Right. I showed up and it was like, mm. you know, they were, they were really pimping it out, and all these kids that I'd known from growing up with, they were a couple years older, and they were all excited, and they, you know, look at what I'm doing as, as really cool. And when people remove from this business can truly, you know, even if I'd only just done one thing they'd still be like you fucking made it man but uh so you know the the bar they had a shitty sound system and like it was not conducive for comedy and so that's all that i had to kind of you know massage when i got there and, and put the sound system in the corner and have everybody go to it would, you know just make it again to my point of like giving yourself a chance to win if you're going to do this business you can't uh, you can't have a plan B and you can't like put obstacles in your own way because they're gonna find you anyway. So it's yeah. like, you know, you're gonna have to get around so much. So it's like, so again, like even having a girlfriend at that time was was getting in my way because it was something she was to on you too. That didn't help. Like, but all, but even having like, you know, getting up to a show or to a point to where I was like, oh man, Comedy Juice when it was the biggest show in the country here, and it was like, I got to a point to a being on them, going from hosting them. Remember, I hosted a lineup here once. This was the first show, too, that I remember. If somebody were to ask me, like, my first great m- time here, it was that show because it was, you know, I met Assad and, and Scott and, and started hosting the Comedy Juice shows, which was such a big deal, and, and here especially. And, and I was hosting one here, and it was, like, Tosh, Dane, Chappelle popped in, Gaffigan was in town, Geraldo was on, who was my favorite comic of all time, mm-hmm. uh, Chris Porter, Bobby Lee, and I think Joe Coy. I mean, on one lineup, I wish I had that, you know. And I know people were listening being like, where are the girls? Well, there probably was one on, but fucking, that was a, you know. They're probably cheating on him somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and so that, uh, you know, I didn't want to get to a point to where, like, I got a chance to, like, host that show. Or even years later, close out that show and then have to go to, like, a girlfriend's birthday dinner. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. things... And also, it matters to, to be with somebody that understands. But well, you, like, made, you made your decision about what you wanted to do. Yeah. And the yeah. commitment was there. What, who were, uh, you know, since you brought up all those guys on, oh, yeah. on the lineup, who were your uh, uh, sort of idols growing up comedic-wise? Oh, man. I mean, Sinbad, which is so crazy that I was with him last night and chatting with him. And, and that was the first stand-up I saw because my dad was a, and is a big Sinbad fan. And, and show me a tape of his VHS, and I was just like, so that was my introduction to the art form. I mean, because I, again, wasn't watching late specials. And I, right. So I, you know, some people again have folks that were like, here's some stand-up records, or like a Cosby or a Prior didn't have that, didn't have you know them being like, hey, there's a stand-up special, you want to watch it? Because again, I don't think they knew because I wasn't the funny kid around the house and stuff that I had that interest. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I, my dad, I think I walked in, he was watching it, and. Heard him laughing, and I saw this bit, and I was immediately hooked, and and then watched like the best of John Belushi uh, SNL VHS, and that was and that, so. Then that kind of opened me up to the sketch world, uh, and then you know, In Living Color became my favorite show of all time. I think I'm still to this day more of an In Living Color than a Mad TV uh, uh, SNL guy, because In Living Color was it just seemed a it was you know scripted, rehearsed. But they just, it seemed like these larger than life characters that were so silly, but seemed so grounded. Homie like, don't play that. I mean, dude, Damon, <laughs> even just kicking with him the other night is so crazy. He's one of my heroes, dude. And, and he made these like characters, they were so real. Like the, the homeless guy that he did, or even Homie the Clown, like you're like, seems like a guy, like a birthday clown that's just falling on hard times and doesn't give a fuck. And like, even as a kid, I was like, it just seems so real, and I could pick up on that. Jim Carrey doing Vera De Milo, like that mm-hmm. really raspy, like you know, <laughs> flexible yoga or uh, workout instructor. It was like seems like a real person, like but so silly. And well, their, and uh, their alumni list is sick, insane. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, and then you know, obviously as I got older, Eddie Murphy. When I heard Dane uh, Cook's first uh, album, Harmful of Swallowed, was fucking just floored at how you know the energy. I think that was like the because you know a lot of guys I'd heard before were a little more slower paced even mm-hmm. Eddie with all the energy and, and characters and uh, impressions like h- had a kind of you know slow like Dane was just kind of came out of the gate just kicked the door down with a blowtorch 
and, uh, and then became a big fan of Gaffigan. I went to uh, Amoeba Records when I first got into it and bought, I mean, I probably took my, my check from Universal Studios uh, playing Wolverine and probably just emptied it on, I want to say, 20 to 30 albums, you know, CDs, when we uh, used to fuck with those and, and got David Cross and, and Gaffigan and... I mean, everybody, man, even a Kathleen Mag uh, Madigan, Madigan one, uh, <clears throat> even though she's kind of on my shit list because I know she's a great comic, but I came here to audition for Last Comic Standing, was not ready. This was like, again, three to four years in, and I know she's sweet. I've talked to her at an airport once. She means well, and I know this was a, a TV show and it's produced. I came in, Alonzo Bowden, Ant, and Kathleen Madigan are the uh, judges. End of the day, literally I was the last comic of the day. I think of the improvs Hollywood. And I'm out there waiting outside. And my manager's like, I got you on audition. And it's the very end. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe Like first TV stamp thing, not ready. I got my Folgers bit. I don't know if you remember that. If you ever saw me do it, people still tell me because I used to, if I had five minutes, three minutes, or 10 minutes, I was opening it and closing with it. It was basically like, I saw a Folgers copy slogan the other day. Like, it's such a misleading slogan. You know, the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. And I was like, yeah, is it? You know, to me, that slogan should be, the best part of waking up is not dying in your sleep. And I was like, to me, that's the best part. You know, and then I do this, yeah, you know. And uh, that's so, my theme song, so stupid. Right? What's that? That's my theme song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I did that right off the bat. And Kathleen stops me maybe 10 seconds in and just goes, whoa, 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 whoa. A Folgers bit? What is it, 1987? Come on, uh, eh, we're, we're good. And I'm the last of the day. And so in my head, I'm just like, man, I, didn't you get all your shots of like shitting on people and whatever? It's three minutes. I'm like, I'm already so nervous because you walk in, they basically go, all right, we're going to push you in. The lights are going to turn on the cameras. I go in, I'm so nervous. She cuts me off. Then I'm kind of just fumbling because I'm so taken yeah. aback by, all right, so, and so I was like, all right, so should I go? And then Alonzo, Fucking to his credit, great dude goes, nah, nah. He goes, hey, hey can let's see, what, what else you got, man? Is there another thing? I go, I go, yeah, I got a, I got a Nyquil bit, and he, start, <laughs> and he starts laughing. He goes, you're just doing all the products that nobody fucking uses anymore. And I was like, yeah, man. And then I riffed about a couple other products of jokes I didn't have. He kind of laughed, and he goes, all right, man. He goes, you're, you're clearly funny. He goes, what's a Nyquil bit? So I do that, kind of <laughs> gets a little chuckles, but at that point it was just the vibe. The room was off. I did that. I did one more joke to kind of save it. I made one quick joke about how I was like, well, this has uh, been awesome. I, this feels a lot like my Little League games because my dad's not here. And then that got a big <laughs> laugh out of Ant. She just goes, ha! Ah! 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 And then I just go, all right, thanks, guys. And then walked out and you, called you, my mom. And I was like, I think I'm never doing comedy again. That was the worst experience of my life. I felt like just the floor had been ripped out from under me. And it was the first real taste of like, you know, people that you because you're doing open mics and all this, people, yeah, yeah, you're you're still in your delusional like, ah, I saw a guy I'm better than at that open mic, or I did a show on a whatever with a dumb drunk audience and got some laughs. So you know, you're getting your you, you know would, validating moments where you can, but this was like across the board, like from people that are doing it professionally right, and for a, a show that is you know claiming to pick the people that can do it, and you're just like you would think that you're being the last one of the day and they knew that. That's what I thought. I was like, just, just let, let me do finish. three exactly. minutes. So that's, that's why it. to this day, I'm just like, I mean, look, I'm not lose, losing sleep over it, but it, uh, it stung it's for a minute. It's not that it bothers you, but it, it's okay. I know. I didn't bring it up unprovoked or anything, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, that, uh, well, that, a, that moment was, was again like defining because, you know, you, I started complaining to my mom and she's like, all right, so what are you going to do? You're going to do a show tomorrow or are you going to quit? And I was like, I mean, I, yeah, I already have a show book. She's like, oh, cool. So don't, don't forget about it. Do that show tomorrow and make and, and, right. and replace your feeling right now and be better tomorrow. And I was just like, okay. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, and again, it's, it can be that cut and dry. You need somebody to tell you that. You need somebody that you respect to tell you that and not do it in a, in a demeaning or derogative way. But also, I just was like, oh, yeah, like, who gives a shit? Like, yeah. And then my mom was like, are you even ready to be on that show? And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't think so. She's like, then why are you bummed? Did you want, did you want them to love your shitty Folgers joke? And I was like, fuck you, mom. <laughs> I, I, I backed that joke. It crushes in the belly room. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. my best joke. <laughs> yeah. That's like going up on stage and going like, come on, audience, laugh. That's my best yeah. joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you may as well get off because <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're yeah. done. Uh, yeah. the, you, you brought up Mad TV. You did 
did you do the got to re- do the reboot yeah, yeah. which uh was a was a i mean look i have nothing but po- i positive uh feelings about the experience because I However, wonder, here we go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look, CW <laughs> fucked it up, man. No promotion, no leniency with pushing the envelope. And I have no problem saying that because they, it's like they bought the show with the intention of, man, it was, it was the edgy rival to SNL. It was on Fox. It was late. It was like they were known for pushing the envelope in ways SNL didn't or couldn't, especially now, man. SNL is truly like, t- like just scaled it back and... And, you know, because of what's the current times and they're not looking to be what what made them what they were. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, man, I'm going to be on a show that's going to do that. Like we have a true opportunity to like be the it show. And whether it's on CW or or not, like who cares? Like it's just they bought the brand so they know. And we had this first table read and it was so oh, it was just so awesome. I don't I haven't had a high like that in a long time where I, you know, loved the group, had felt so the process was was pretty rigorous and and stressful and and I was in Vegas uh doing shows and and I started to hear rumblings they one kid found out he got it after we tested each three times and and which is so stressful doing multiple characters and things and you get laughs and then you're just like not hearing anything and one kid found out and he posted it before he was supposed to and then uh I hit up Amir and I was like did you find out and he's my boy so he was like yeah I did and then I'm just like fuck dude people are saying it's just not happening was Amir on that too yeah Amir was on it too mm-hmm. and so uh and you know we came up together so that was really cool but I was you know I was like pumped for him so I was like you know and then the amount of things I'd had get close on and not happen and still to this day I gotten you know built up a, a thick skin for it to where I was like all right I know how to adjust my mindset I wanted that really bad wasn't meant to be you do all that cliche bullshit convince yourself Thankfully, I've got podcast to edit and shows to do tonight, which is what you have to do other, so that you're not just doing acting, so that you don't put right. all your eggs in one basket. Ooh. And you go, I can't be bummed because I have a show to do. And it's unprofessional and just not going to progress me in any way if I let this affect my show. Because then I'll really be down. Because then I'll get off stage and go, oh, wow. Then you let it affect two things. You're a true piece of shit. Well, and it's, so, it's uh, important. I, I agree with you totally. Yeah. It's important to have a whole bunch of things going on. To, that's just for, for so, me. That's helped. Yeah. You know, everyone's different. Some people can just do just do acting, and I mean, you know, f- and there's again, like everyone's path is different. You know, Divine has even told me sometimes, like, man, maybe stop doing the podcast and put more energy into this or that, and or less on stand up because he's you know just hit it hard with acting. And then stand up took a back seat for him, and then he got a special uh, because the acting stuff had blown up so much that they're like, "All right, well, he's so well known. Stand up is still a part of what you do, but he's not doing it as much, but but enough to still keep his chops uh, Mm -hmm. sharp." And so, but I was like, "No," because the podcast and stand up have given me a lot of opportunities and and filled me in ways that that. you know, oh, it, I didn't. It's got to. I, the fact that, that you, you do that, you do the podcast, you do stand-up. You, everything begets everything, you know? Yeah, I think it does. I think it, it all plays a part in the fact that, you, that anybody uh, gets not so much successful, but gets work at something else. It yeah. all kind of like, I had an acting teacher that once said, when you think you can't do one thing, do three. It, yeah. It's like it'll just... I've always been you, an advocate of that, too. Like, you... There's always more you could be doing, and if you're not doing it, somebody else is. Yeah. And also, you don't know how much you can do until you, you try to do it all and, and manage and prioritize. And there's, you know, I I'd also subscribe to you can spread yourself too thin and things can suffer if you don't have the appropriate amount of attention on certain things, which I've experienced. But no, you know, the Mad TV thing was was great because of getting to flex the sketch muscle which I you know just Mm -hmm. grew up wanting to do so bad again in living color and all the the YouTube videos I did were all sketch character related and so it was such a high and then it was like slowly they after that first table read they just started pulling things and be like nah we can't say that we can't do that and then you're just like oh man what about that first table read where like everything was so great we pushed the envelope and everybody was on the same page and then people start just going back on their word and getting nervous and being like and then all of a sudden the show is just not even the show they're not promoting it the writers feel like their hands are tied because they're like we're going to write something great and no it's not getting on so now they're watering down what they're doing but again so fun the live shows the cast the I mean the, the whole family element that everyone, you know, attests to from being on a show is all really great. And uh, but a, I mean, a true bummer, man. I, I there's no reason that sh- there's no reason I shouldn't still be 
doing that. Yeah. Especially with that uh, that brand. Like that, it's that's a just, that's just a step in your ladder. Your career yeah. so far is from what I've seen has been really really good, and you're just beginning. It it's uh, you know you've got worlds to conquer, which I, I think you will. I appreciate mean, that. You you're you're a very good actor. You're I've. Believe it or not, I have seen your stand-up. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I'm always curious with how much you're out here, how much you poke your head in. or I just once in a while I do, depending on, on who's on. And uh, I'll, I'll go, if I can sneak in for a minute. Yeah. Just to, years ago, I used to watch all those guys. You but did? It, it was, oh, yeah, between. Well, because us. you had more help out here? Because you just. No, it was, I would come in when I didn't work. I used to live closer by. Oh, yeah, So, okay. like, with uh, George Wallace and Jerry Seinfeld oh, and um, all those guys, Jay Leno. You know, I'd come to a show and, and just watch these guys. I live too far away now to, yeah. to do that. And there's, now there's 250,000 comics when there used to be 250. And, uh, That's it's, so bonkers to me. Yeah. Oh, the, it, there's just a lot. Everybody and his mother, because of YouTube and, and the fact that you can say something funny in the living room. Yeah, is, makes is, you feel like you can. You can be a comic. Anyway, Adam, I want to thank you so much because I have to go to work. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> I love you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so I glad really you're doing this. It. This is uh it, it's it's been I a mean, blast. You talking about just the beginning. It's like you also finding, you know, and recognizing <laughs> the uh, the kinship you have with people and how much people love you and finally taking advantage. It's like at some point, I was telling a, a buddy of mine this who was thinking about asking, you know, a, a famous friend of his for a, a help and I was like, dude, at some point you have to recognize when you're a good person and you're not a piece of shit, people like you, that like asking for favors or taking advantage of these relationships that you've built, like at some point you have to make good on that, you mm -hmm. know? And doing this is like a great example of that. Well, or the people you. that are, you've already told me about, that you've had on that are, you know, in the pipeline, it's like, of course that's gonna happen because people like, you know, you could have asked for anything and people would uh, would come running. But this I, is like the, the avenue to, to do I, it. I appreciate that. People have been very, very cooperative yeah. for me. And, and I'm so grateful for that because it's, you know, look, I understand everybody's busy. And uh, the fact that those of you that have said yes so far and, and those who have committed, I feel like, wow, really? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I am ju I'm blessed in that in that regard. Would you ever ask if Paul McCartney comes back? I, would, you, I just, would you ask yeah. him to do the podcast? If, if I because see him I again, did, did <laughs> when you, he was he here. <laughs> First of all, I got off stage. This is again why this place is so magical. I got off stage. Somebody goes right as soon as I get off. Somebody who was going up next goes, Paul McCartney's here, and it was a comedy you show. And it was maybe, this was maybe five, six years ago. And there was maybe 50, 60 people in the crowd. Later that night, by the way, it was, I, th I think, or maybe it was the next week when Craig Robinson and Chappelle did the uh, improvised musical on the first gay rapper, which was to mm -hmm. this day one of the best things I've ever seen. McCartney, they go, he's in the back. So I go, I'm going to walk by that back door in the showroom, walk by him so that he can see me because he just saw my set. Wave me over, tap me, and we can become best friends forever. And maybe I'll become <laughs> uh, a new Beatle. And so I walk by him. And he taps me on the shoulder. He goes, hey. He goes, Adam. He goes, great set. And I'm doing this dumb Shania Twain joke. And he goes, he goes, oh, that don't impress me much. It's very funny. Very funny. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. I go, thanks, man. He goes, you want to sit down and have a drink? And I was like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll drink anything. I'll do anything to you. I'm very vulnerable right now. Like, what do you, what do you want, you know? And so we sit down. And he goes, uh, he goes, what are we having? And I go, I, dude, you literally, I, you know, what do you think? He goes, let's get margaritas. I go, fucking Obviously, dude, you literally could have been like, let's drink our own piss and go rob a Baskin Robbins and set a midget on fire. I was like, dude, you're driving the ship tonight. Whatever you say, I'm going to yes and. So we drank margaritas. We start cheers and he goes, what do we cheers to? I mean, this is all like outer body shit, right? And I go, to being best friends forever. He goes, what else? And then he kind of smiles and then he goes, and he goes, no, nah, he goes, to new friendships. He goes, to life, love and happiness. And I go, all right, man, we cheers. I'm not even listening to the show because the whole time I'm like, can't believe I'm sitting next to him. Like right. he kept turning to me too to like share that comedic. Like if you're in a movie and a show and you're with somebody, you want to check in with them when something funny happens. Be like, do we have similar sensibilities? But I wasn't listening, so Paul would turn to look at me and then I would just go <laughs> and just like overcompensate and laugh really hard. And then I got up to leave very awkwardly and was like, all right, man. I'll, uh, you know, I was like, see you when, see you when to see to keep living your dreams, man. And he was just like, all right. He's like, yeah. And I was like, I got a podcast. Would you ever? Uh, 
would you? And he was like, oh, it's, you know, he's like, no, I've got to get to leave for Japan at, at 10 in the morning. I go, dude, we will come to you at 8. And he just goes, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and then he smiles again and shakes my hand. And he goes, you're very funny. He goes, good luck to you. And I was just like, oh, man. Well, honesty. So yeah. cool. But I mean, it's one of those, again, Hail Mary, roll the dice moments where I was like, I'm never going to see him in this environment right or again. talk to him again. If I see him on the street, like, what, how many years later? Hey, Paul, you're at the sit. We had margaritas. I fucking, you know, I, I, you know, I laughed too hard at you. And, you know, you smell great. Like, what do you remember <laughs> about that night, you know? Yeah, uh, but I feel like you. Joe Rogan? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have that car blanche, though, I feel like, when people come through to, uh, to roll the dice and, and ask anybody. Which Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you, you know, you, you have to be cool about it, you know, with, like, uh, bigger names. But at the same time, there are some people I, I would just go, hey. Yeah. Like you did. Yeah. I'm doing a podcast. Yeah. You know, I'd so love to do. have you on. Yeah. If if you can squeeze it in. If you can't, well, we'll, fuck, we'll fuck move off. on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Eddie. Thank you, Thanks, Adam. Buddy. I really appreciate it. Guys, thank you very much for listening. This has been great. You're really going to enjoy this one. Till next time, we're out. <laughs>